I'm Vidya Dinka. Um, I coordinate Growth Watch and I'm the president of INSTA, Indian Social Action Forum. And I welcome you to today's webinar uh, on behalf of the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt and Life and Nature Safeguard Platform. This is a follow-up webinar. It's on external debt, on energy, and the prospects of economic recovery in Bangladesh. Does that sound sort of familiar? It could be because you were part of the first seminar. So what do they call it? Like seminar 1.0, they call it, or whatever. So on 2nd of June, 2020, the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt, Democratic Budget Movement, Japan Center for Sustainable Environment and Society, JAXA's NGO Forum on ADB, and Urgewald um, had organized an online seminar on the same topic. And today uh, we are having a follow up. And why do we need a follow up? Well, because um, I guess Bengalis love their Adda and need to come again and again because it's never enough. So here we are, the first time we had speakers, um, of course, Manowar Mustafa Bhai, and then Yuki Tanabe, who is director of JAXUS. We had Nora Sausmikat, a sinologist with Urgewald. We had Ryan Hassan, executive director of the NGO Forum on ADB. We had Siddharth Akali, who is executive director of the Coalition for Human Rights and Development, CHRD. Um, well, so today we meet for some Adda. There were also issues that couldn't be discussed. We didn't have um, enough time because of the paucity of time in the last webinar on 2nd June. There was this felt need to reconvene. And therefore, we are having this um, whatever, 1.1 or 1.2 or 2.0, whatever you call it, whatever Generation Next calls it. Um, we'll get an update from all the speakers on their respective topics. We'll also give you enough time to actually air your views. Um, we realized that last time it was very, very limited. People could only put in their questions in the chat box and couldn't actually um, articulate uh, their concerns um, because really this focus on Bangladesh and we know that we have a lot of people from Bangladesh who are interested in discussing these topics of debt and energy projects, etc., and especially economic recovery in the COVID-19 period. Um, but there are people across the globe that are very interested in where Bangladesh is, growing, is going in its debt crisis, in the way energy projects and dirty energy projects are being pumped into Bangladesh and what it can mean for communities that are already struggling with everything happening to them. We have two rapporteurs, just like last time. We have Kuntal Roy and Sajjad Hussain um, Tuhim. Um, we have the mandatory welcome speech because can we not be welcome? No, we must be. And then we have a key speaker in Monover Mustafa. Um, after that, we'll have guest speakers, seven minutes each. This time it's Wakako Kobayashi uh, from JAXIS. There's Ryan Hassan yet again, uh, executive director of NGO Forum on um, ADB. Miss Nora Sasmikat could not join us today. She has um, uh, to be at a family event, uh, which was planned earlier. In of Siddharth, um, we are having Mark Fodor. Uh, he's campaign coordinator of Defenders in Development for CHRD. After that, we have the Q&A, uh, where you can voice um, your questions, you can comment, etc. cetera. Um, and then uh, some um, open discussion. Shall I give you, because of course, I am not just the moderator of the session, I'm also the principal in the house, and therefore, please keep your mic muted. Uh, please turn on your mic only when you have been given the floor to speak. Um, and I would do that occasionally, so be nice to me. Only uh, the three speakers will keep their video on, other, particip uh, other participants in this um, seminar, we request you to please uh, turn your video camera off. Uh, so until we can actually physically reconvene, we'll have to follow the Zoom rules. Um, and, um, and so please bear with me on this.
do ask your questions here in the chat box. The chat box button is at the bottom of your um, screen. So please look for it, um, open it up, and you can chat, um, and your um, messages will get across to the organizers and the panelists, um, and we will uh, see that they are answered. Do keep your questions um, short. Uh, comments and observations are, of course, very, very welcome. Um, participants who have connected with this Adda through Facebook, please ask your questions in the comment section on uh, FB. Do mention the speaker's name um, from whom you are expecting your answer. All the speakers, listen up. Do keep the time in mind. Um, we want to be expansive. We want everyone's voice to come out and therefore the speakers cannot um, exceed time. I will um, help you to keep to the allocated time. I will give you a notice when you have just one minute to finish. Is that okay? Uh, we have some questions uh, remaining to be answered from last time. And um, um, and, and maybe we'll start with that, but let's see. Um, the principal can always decide. Arbitrariness is king. Um, let's go directly into uh, this follow-up uh, session on external debt, energy projects, and uh, uh, the economic recovery scenario for Bangladesh. And uh, I invite um, Mehdi, um, Hassan Mehdi, uh, who is member secretary of the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt, um, and he's also executive director of CLEAN, Coastal Livelihood and Environmental Action Network. Mehdi, you have a nice task. Uh, there are no flowers to give, but please welcome us. Thank you very much, uh, Vidya, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, that's the only word I can say. Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, follow-up webinar on external debt, energy, and economic recovery of Bangladesh. And uh, we are thankful to uh, Life and Nature Safeguard uh, Platform of Bangladesh, which is a Bangladeshi civil society organization, um, to join with us uh, this time. Uh, we are we are every uh, in every uh, webinar we are trying to expand our uh, horizon uh, with different uh, civil society organizations. You know, last time. Uh, democratic budget movement, NGO Forum and NDBs, Access, and Urge all joined with us. Uh, this time we uh, we are working with uh, LNSP together. We could not allow you everybody last in last meeting uh, to ask questions because of shortage of time. Uh, uh, but uh, this time we will focus on that. Uh, in the uh, after that meeting, uh, the budget uh, has been submitted to National Par Parliament of Bangladesh. Uh, several Japanese companies organized their AGM, including Sumitomo, Mitsubishi, and uh, Sumitomo uh, SMBC, Sumitomo Mitsubishi Banking Corporation. So uh, we'll get the update on that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, ADB expanded its, uh, its uh, loan uh, on, focused on COVID-19, and the World Bank also uh, took some decisions. So we'll get some updates from uh, Ryan Hassan and Mark Coder on that. And uh, we'll get uh, Japanese update from uh, Wakako first, and Yuki uh, Yuki will uh, contribute, uh, add with some uh, him. Uh, so thank you very much once again. Uh, it's a very short uh, uh, brief on that program. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Um, so um, uh, here, uh, Mehdi has set the tone, and we'll go right into um, listening to our key speaker who, of course, is Mr. Manohar Mustafa. Uh, Manohar uh, Mustafa is the Bangladesh country advisor for the European Climate Fund, ECF. Uh, if you're wondering how that came to, me, to be, because last time we introduced him differently, well, uh, his new avatar, um, I, I, I'm guessing that, no. I, I don't think I'm guessing right. I was thinking maybe it's his first big webinar uh, after his ECF country advisor, but maybe not. Um, so before joining the European Climate Foundation, 
Uh, Monover has been the convener of the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt. That is how you met him last time. And he's also the General Secretary of the Democratic Budget Movement in Bangladesh. He has completed his Master's in Political Economy from Cleveland State University, USA, and he's gathered great expertise in economic analysis through working in Gono Shahajjo Shongstha, GSS, the Hunger Project in Bangladesh, and many other such progressive um, organizations. Monohar Da will today update us on aspects of the energy sector in the recently presented annual budget of Bangladesh 2020-21 that uh, Mehdi just mentioned, which is actually in the process of endorsement by parliament. Monohar Da, up to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Bidda. And Bidda has said the tone of this meeting, uh, something differently. I love it. Uh, it would be a little informal rather than the typical formal one. So it would be a typical Anta, Bangladeshi Adda, that she has set the tone on. And I love this. I love this uh, format. So, uh, <clears throat> but first of all, let me, let me say something that it would have been better had I not been asked to uh, speak today. Because I am tired of speaking on the same issue for last two weeks uh, in one way or another. So I will be repeating all those as budget has been placed on the 11th of this month and people are raising questions on different aspects of budgetary process, um, focusing on their own sectors. Uh, I have been doing the same. Uh, putting different hats on my head. Anyway, so let me speak on here. Last time on the 2nd of June, we have been talking about external debt and energy sector in Bangladesh. And at that time, budget was not been placed in the parliament. It has been placed on the 11th of this month. And people who are concerned about energy and power sector, uh, they have seen it quite astonishingly because nothing has been changed from the part of, part of the government, it, it still it is business as usual. Meaning they have, done, they have proposed something as they have been doing for the last couple of years. So we didn't see any, we didn't see that much changes in the budgetary format as far as uh, outlays are concerned and, and their policy concerns as well. So let me let me share some of those facts and figures very quickly, and I would love to uh, I would love to solicit questions rather than answers uh, from your side. So let me say something about uh, actually what was what were the major challenges before our, our sector. Uh, in my view, obviously from others, uh, there are four major challenges that our power sector has been in for last couple of years. The first one is the overcapacity to produce uh, the electricity. This is one thing. And overcapacity is something quite different. I could show you just one slide about the overcapacity. You will guess something exactly what is happening uh, or what is the current status of, uh, of that state. This is something, just, just look at this piece. You see, I just I just developed this uh, uh, graph. You see, it starts from 2011 and now it's 2020. It, it clearly shows that our overcapacity in terms of two different aspects, as per maximum demand and as per maximum generation. You see, as per maximum demand, it was 499 megawatt in 2011. Now. In 2019, it has, it has come to a peak of 5,971. And perhaps in 2020, uh, I, I didn't get the actual data, that's why I just made it in blank, I just put blank. But in terms of maximum generation, now it is 10,216 megawatt. It's, it's, it's quite, unimaginable even on part of us 
uh, I'm coming back to this. <coughs> anyway, so what we have seen the overcapacity is, is one of the major concerns before the power sector. The second one is underutilization of the power plants. As you know, even I got the information, uh, information for the last, last week information, it's the 17th of June. There were 45 power plants were kept quite idle out of 146. So underutilization is one of the major problems, major challenges faces our, our, power, sec, our power, uh, uh, division faces. The third one is lower level of efficiency. And I, I, I told you the other day, I mean, on the 2nd of June, that our, our efficiency level is very low. And majority of our power plants, uh, over 55% of the power plants operate at lower efficiency, less than 40%. The fourth major challenge before our power sector was fiscal and financial burden that this, that this sector is, you know, uh, as, as the sector is getting so much money from our exchequer. So now it has loans and subsidies from the government side. It, has, it, it is being increased day by day. And the power division is getting so much money from the government as subsidies or loans. Uh, it, has, it has gone up to 9,000, I, 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 I would say, 92 billion Bangladeshi taka for the current fiscal year. Uh, this is one of the important aspect as far as fiscal and financial burden is concerned. And one of the important, another aspect of, uh, of this financial pressure is on capacity payment um, for those power plants who we are forced to keep them idle. So these are the four major challenges before the power sector. It has been the case for long. And let's see how uh, this year's budget has come up with considering all those uh, power all the challenges. So it has been shown in the budget document that our budget, this year's budget is kind of used, uh, kind of five trillion dollar, more than five trillion, five trillion Bangladeshi taka. So this power sector has got uh, 267 billion Bangladeshi taka. And uh, especially electricity division or power division got uh, 248 billion. Uh, and what we have seen that this, in this uh, fiscal year, there would be 88 different power related projects that would be implemented by the power division in this fiscal year. And majority of those projects are basically continuing projects. I would rather say 40% of those projects are continuing projects. It means it has started later and still it continues. And 28% projects are carryover projects, and there would be 31% projects that would be ended. That's what we call the concluding projects. We ended during this fiscal year. Interestingly, there are no new investment projects uh, seen in the budget, particularly for this year, except one technical uh, project. So, considering all this, since the amount of money it has got from the uh, national budget is quite significant. It, it is more than 3% increase from the previous uh, year's allocation. So we don't see any uh, significant changes uh, that we have been talking about during the last um, <coughs> couple of years, couple of months. And that, we have one uh, minute more, Manu. Sure. So considering all these, uh, we, have, we have some clear observations. One is this power division, I mean the electricity division, needs to reduce its financial burden owing to overcapacity capacity rate cost as those have fiscal pressure on the government. Second thing that what we have been, we have, we have observed that renewable energy based power plants are limited in numbers under the public sector power plants. So this is one of the area that uh, government should pay particular attention to. The third observation is, or suggestion is, should be Government should renegotiate with development partners and private sector regarding redirecting resources for implementing clean energy projects uh, for, for quite understandable reasons. And government should make a clear exit plan for the quick rental power plants and should gradually phase out those projects. Uh, 
this is one of the important observations that, if, that we should offer as a, a recommendation. And government should renegotiate with independent power plants about the terms and conditions for different types of payment, including capacity payment, given the charging power demand, particularly at the time of COVID. This is one of the, uh, and even we ask, ask to uh, no, we con consider the force measure clause of the contact between uh, power division and IPP owners. Uh, one of the disappointing thing that we have observed this year that the power tariff is always subsidized. It is revised in February, but interestingly, government has placed a new bill in the parliament asking, uh, empowering the regulatory commission to raise the power tariff more than once a year. Earlier, they, it was, they, were, they were allowed to raise the power tariff once in a year. So this is one of the serious concerns that people are raising their voices against. And the last one is the power division should work more on the overcapacity in power generation in the coming days. Uh, and in this connection, development partners need to approach for redirecting their support, not for coal, but for clean energy based on power generation projects. Uh, and finally, the power division needs to revisit basically the demand for electricity in relation to the capacity of the economy or uh, economy of Bangladesh in general. Thank you. Thank you, Monorda. That was fantastic. Uh, such a uh, such an overview, but so uh, full and rich with data and with analysis. Perfect. Um, you really set the tone for a fantastic adda, and um, I think um, it's clear that it's business as usual, but also uh, with a disaster or a or a catastrophe um, of the uh, COVID nineteen kind. I guess there'll be more of um, it, like almost like disaster capitalism or something like that. Um, Miss Wakako Kobayashi is a program staff at the Japan Center for Sustainable Environment and Society, JAXIS. Um, so she's Yuki's um, uh, you know, uh, contemporary and um, uh, office mate. Miss Wakako is representing Yuki from Japan, she says, and she will provide us updates on the recent letter of the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt to the Prime Minister, uh, the Finance Minister, the foreign minister and JICA uh, that Jaxis uh, passed on. Um, remember, many of us who've been, um, who have joined this um, follow up uh, seminar or webinar or ADDA have actually signed on to that letter, uh, you know, that the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt uh, wrote up. She will also share about the recent annual general uh, meetings. Um, remember, Mehdi mentioned that um, recently in this, this last week, we've, we've had, um, I think, seven of the major um, uh, financiers from Japan, or maybe it's six of the major financiers from Japan uh, of coal um, actually have their AGMs. So, um, there has been an addressing of the shareholders and the um, owners of these companies, Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, SMBC was today. Uh, and JAXIS has been in the forefront of actually pushing these institutions. Um, uh, so Wakako, over to you. Tell us uh, more and update us. Thank you so much, Vedia. Um, I actually presented, uh, prepared a PowerPoint slide so I'd like to share my screen with everyone. Yes, please. Okay. So again, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. My name is Wakako Kobayashi, and I'm a program staff at JAXS. And today I will be giving an update on the Matabari Cold Fire Power Project. So this is my agenda. First, I will start with JICA and the Japanese government on the Matabari coal plant project. Then I will move on to updates on Sumitomo Corporation and their annual general meeting. And then lastly, I will talk about steps moving forward for JAXIS. So firstly, on June 15th, 
JAXA sent out BWGED's letter that all of you signed, or most of you signed, through postage to the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, the Japanese Minister for Foreign Affairs Toshimitsu Motegi, and JICA President Shinichi Kitaoka. And amongst the three recipients, we heard back from a JICA representative that they indeed received the letter. But since the last seminar, there are some key updates on Matabari Phase 2 and the Power System Master Plan. And these were both confirmed by Yuki through email exchanges with JICA staff and Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, otherwise known as MOFA. So firstly, MOFA decided to proceed with a preparatory survey for feasibility study for Matabari Phase 2. And following this, JICA started its consultant bidding process this Wednesday on June 24th. JICA also announced that the study period of the preparatory survey um, is set from September 10, 2020 to September 30, 2021. And based on past trends, the Japanese government typically approves loans for Bangla Bangladesh in June and considering the 120-day disclosure period of an environmental impact assessment, um, the first Matapari II loan agreement may take place in June 2022. Okay. Secondly, upon a request from the Bangladesh government, MOFA is now considering technical assistance for the revision of Bangladesh's power system master plan. Um, however, the schedule for this is still unclear. Um, lastly, there was a question on the topic regarding stakeholder involvement during the revision of the Power Master Plan. And I'd just like to mention that JICA is responsible for this, and it's likely that consultation between JICA committee members and stakeholders will take place um, once the technical assistant begins. So as such, J JAXIS, we can reach out to JICA asking if they could create some space for discussion with Bangladesh groups to ensure that more civil society organizations and experts are involved in this process. Okay. Relating to JICA and the Japanese government, um, in response to MOFA's decision that I just mentioned, five Japanese environmental NGOs, including JAXIS, released a joint statement expressing their disappointment. The joint statement urges MOFA to reverse their decision based on several arguments that were presented by Yuki at the last seminar. Um, one great news is that today, the United Kingdom's COP26 envoy, Mr. John Merton, tweeted that joint statement that we released. And you can see here on the left side, um, a screenshot from his tweet. Uh, we also ran a social media advertising campaign targeting JICA and the Japanese government, urging them to withdraw from the Matabari Coal Project and there is a screenshot here on the right from our Facebook. So next I'd like to move on to Sumitomo Corporation. Sumitomo had their annual general meeting last Friday on June 19th. And because Sumitomo is the EPC contractor for Matarbari phase one, this makes them a potential EPC contractor for phase two. And as such, it was very, very important for us to take action on the AGM day. Um, in the morning of the day, APMDD held an online rally, which was, went very successfully, moderated by Vidya. Um, and it was followed by an open letter, uh, email blast, and a Twitter storm. And JAXAS worked alongside Mighty Earth to target Sumitomo for a series of online advertisements that we ran on several social media accounts through Facebook and Twitter. So, on the left, you can see an advertisement that we shared on Facebook through No Coal Japan. And on the right, you can see um, a collage that I created with people holding up signs saying Sumitomo, no more coal, um, shift into renewables. Uh, there were no major results from Sumitomo's AGM itself. However, Sumitomo released a revised version of their climate policy released in August 2019 on June 18. Um, the day before the AGM, stating that the company would aim carbon neutrality by 2050. Sumitomo's revised policy leaves loopholes that allow them to continue developing new coal plants. So one loophole is that it allows Sumitomo to continue supporting coal fire power generation businesses that Sumitomo deems essential 
to the economic and industrial development of the local community and where the project is complying with the policies of the Japanese and host country governments. Um, and moreover, Sumitomo's commitment to carbon neutrality by 2050 only includes the direct and indirect CO2 emissions from their own businesses, including subsidiaries. So this creates another loophole in the policy that the extent of business activities covered under you know, their uh, goal of carbon neutrality does not include building coal plants for other companies. So in this case, the Matabari coal plants is out of scope. And that's a serious issue that we see. Um, so lastly, I just like to mention some of the steps moving forward for JAXIS. Uh, we have three main steps moving forward with our efforts on the Matabari uh, coal-fired power project. We plan to have direct meetings with MOFA and JICA representatives to continue gathering information about the project. And we also hope to utilize our role in JICA's advisory committee for environmental and social considerations as an opportunity to gather any project updates or movements. And then secondly, we will continue to run social media and online advertising campaigns focusing on the government of Japan and JICA. Um, hopefully, we can work on expanding the scope of these campaigns so it reaches a wider audience, but also make sure that it targets the right people. And lastly, uh, given Sumitomo's role as an EPC contractor for Matabari Phase 1 and, pot and potentially for Phase 2, we will continue to run advertisements and online campaigns targeting Sumitomo. And for this initiative, we'll be coordinating with Mighty Earth and Market Forces. So that was kind of a quick update on me on behalf of um, JAXIS, but if there are any um, questions from in the audience, then I'd, I'm happy to answer any of them or Yuki. So thank you so much. Thank you, Wakako. That was fantastic. And uh, I think this is the future, huh? All of us need to have more young people like Wakako on our side, fighting the good fight, uh, and so creatively and so consistently. Um, basically, we have great challenges that we face in our countries and all across Asia. And I think it's the youth that will lead any change that we um, have been hoping for all our life. Um, next, there's someone who um, is, uh, well, not as young as Wakako, but uh, quite young and quite dashing. The executive director of NGO Forum on ADB um, joins us from Manila, and he will update us on COVID-19 recovery packages uh, that um, AIIB and ADB and perhaps other banks like the World Bank, uh, the New Development Bank, etc., are pushing all across. Um, you know, uh, every disaster is an opportunity for banks like these. And uh, he will also um, brief us on the recently concluded um, Asian Clean Energy Forum, ACEF 2020, which was organized by the ADB. Mr. Ryan Hassan. The mic is yours. Uh, thank you, Vidya. That was a lot of high praise late in the evening. I needed that, so needed I'll avoid it. sugar After for three dessert. webinars, yes, you needed that. <laughs> uh, but, but in your intro, you went over so many issues. I don't know in seven minutes if I'll be able to go into all of that. So, we'll give you one more minute if you will do justice, but you must do justice. Less is more, man. Less is more. I'll try to speak less. Uh, but um, just getting straight into it, uh, a quick update on the recovery packages and the stimulus packages. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, new participants here, but some of you have probably heard all of this before, so uh, I will be guilty of repeating myself. On the ADB side, you have a $20 billion carved out COVID-19 recovery package. They announced it, uh, I think, May 16th, and already they have started co-financing in Bangladesh, they have started COVID-19 stimulus in India, they have started in Indonesia, in the Philippines. Uh, you have to really watch the fine print of these loans under the COVID-19 uh, recovery. So it usually has three or four components, regardless of which bank you're looking at, World Bank, AIB, or ADB. 
The first thing is it's designed for uh, health infrastructure and health recovery. So components of the loan is targeted towards building health infrastructure and addressing health needs. COVID-19 happened, America went into lockdown. The first stimulus by Trump was announced for which sector? Airline bailouts. So it didn't go to public health. It didn't go to uh, small and medium enterprises. It went to the airlines. Uh, if you look at Bangladesh specifically, and you go into COVID-19 lockdown, economic recovery, the first sector the government started talking about was the garment sector. And the billions of takas which were allocated was to make sure that the garment sector does not collapse completely. Now, obviously, when you look at the states, it's a very diverse economy with multiple sectors which are operating in the global market. So if one part of the economy collapses, other parts may pick up. Bangladesh does not have that luxury. It's a single economy uh, driven, single sector economy driven country, very much like Nepal and tourism or Philippines and overseas migrant workers, uh, Bangladesh garment sector. You know, that, that's the first thing which is going to pop to mind in terms of bringing foreign currency reserves. So in a way, uh, I, would, I would probably echo what uh, Monwar Bhai is saying, that the budget, the budget is not reflecting the needs of the people, but the budget is reflecting the survival of the economy and a poorly structured and a poorly planned economy to begin with prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, why did we have that narrow vision? That's a completely different for a definitely it. I'll just show one slide and bring this back down to the MDBs. Um, if you allow me, this is from uh, a little bit of touch upon the ASEF. So I, I did this presentation with the ADB a few days ago, Vidya moderated that, and uh, we were talking to the uh, director for the energy program of ADB headquarters, and we just flagged these figures down to them of where ADB was lending in its entire energy portfolio from 2014 to 2017. The data is from change now. So if you look at the black line on the graph, that's the overall energy investment from 2014 to 2017. If you look at the blue line, that is what you want to focus on. It's on energy access. So power lines, distribution, transmission. The blue line is the national grid. That is off-grid, decentralized, renewable energy in far-off remote villages and islands where the poorest of the poor need access to electricity. And the last one is even more important than that, which is cooking and heating. Now, the, the United Nations Sustainable Energy for All, as well as the WHO, have both agreed that energy access and the lack of it directly led to more and more infections spreading around. There's a direct correlation between not having electricity and being vulnerable towards uh, being exposed to the pandemic. Why? You do not have access to hot water. You do not have access to healthcare. You do not have access to information about how to protect yourself because your phone's dead. You don't have Wi-Fi. You don't have electricity, forget about the internet, right? So the entire question now, I guess on everybody's mind is energy access. And if you looked at Monorbai's presentation, we have overproduced. The country has thousands of megawatts of energy, but it has not provided access of that energy to the people. So where did this energy go and why did you make it? Now even your industries are collapsing. So this is not even a question of, sometimes I wonder, you know, is there like an evil mind behind it or is it just plain ignorance? And in some cases, it seems like it's corruption, it's poor political leadership, it's poor decision-making at the highest level of planning. All of that has contributed to the current crisis in which we are. So this is not only just about energy and the wrong kind of financing. This is just poor development planning, which did not look at the welfare of the people. So that has to be up front and center in this discussion. So I'll just switch off my slide there um, because I'll end up talking at the slide. But 
what I wanted to do was probably talk a little bit about the social stuff. Um, we have been talking about energy, but we have not really looked at the impact of that on the economy and vis-a-vis -vis on society in the webinars that we have done with the Bangladesh Working Group, right? Um, so one of the things which I wanted to address on, and it was a news article which came out, which is just a simple, simple economic fact that inflation is leading for the Bangladesh Taka to depreciate against the US dollar, right? It's a simple, simple, anybody, even a, a child in grade five will figure that out, right? Or global trade has stopped and poorer economies will shoot up and the dollars will balloon up the moment you break it down into local currency. So I remember before the pandemic, it was 79 taka for the dollar. Uh, right now, the banks are saying 84.9. That's according to the Bangladesh Bank, the central bank. Uh, commercial banks are even selling it off at 86 taka. Plus, the starvation for the US dollar is so high that private banks are now giving 2% rebate on remittances being sent. So that shows you the, the real hunger that we have because of the shutting down of the garment sector, because that was, our, that was our foreign currency generator. So anybody who wants to send money is now in a position that the government really wants it. So what are the figures? If you compare the figures of remittances and foreign currency, foreign currency reserve, Last year, we were at this time, $1.1 billion was coming into the country. Today, it's less than 200 million. And that is an alarming, alarming figure for the government to consider. Now, what does that have to do with impact on society? What, it, what was fascinating at the same time, heartbreaking to read, there is a sudden increase in child marriages in Bangladesh since the pandemic started. And the child marriages are, um, it's, it's illegal. I mean, we have a constitutional law against child marriages. And this is a draconian thing, which used to happen in the 80s when I remember I was a kid. It used to scare the life out of me looking at my friends in school. But now it's come back to haunt us again. And this is a recent study, a survey done by the BRAC Gender Justice. BRAC is one of the largest NGOs in the country. So they did this gender justice um, division survey, they looked at, they interviewed 557 people across 11 districts, 72 people witnessed 73 child marriages. And I'll give you an example of one village in Kurigram. In Kurigram in February, there were 40 child marriages. In March, there were 29, there was 19 child marriages. In May, there were 33 child marriages. 62% of the husbands were overseas Bangladeshi workers who returned back with dollars. And that's your connection. The parents are so nervous and so scared and insecure about their children's future that they will marry them off to overseas Bangladesh workers in the hope that at least the dollar is way more stronger than the local economy. At least in the long-term future, there might be something for them to eat. And that is the psychology of the poor. And if we do not bring that into our climate advocacy and on our energy transition conversations, then we will be missing the plot. Um, my, my sentiments are pretty strong around this because I had a webinar on this issue really early in the morning. And I was talking to folks in the States, uh, Boston University folks, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, academics from JNU, who are all looking at energy transition and all of that. And we all came to the uh, conclusion that the Green New Deal does not apply for lower and middle income countries as it does to the West and the North. Because you need a multicolored deal. You cannot look at inequality and you cannot say that those jobs and those people who are working in the fossil fuel industry or the garments industry are not a part of your just transition. They have to be upfront and center at the part of that because of all the labor groups that we represent, if we leave them behind in our climate campaigning, then this is the scenario that you're going to end up with. Child marriages everywhere. Overseas Filipino workers are begging outside my door. That's a reality. Jeepney drivers are begging outside my door. Jeepney runs on fossil fuel. 
if you tell me, all right, let's just transition Manila, get fossil fuel out, what is going to happen to that gypsy driver? So, so we really have to think about what's really happening at this present time in terms of economic recovery. And economic recovery and social recovery go hand in hand, as does the entire conversation of just transition. Now, if you go deeper into just transition, last minute, um, then the last few seconds, actually. All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I want to end on a positive note. It's been doom and gloom from my side. So uh, the solution is actually clean energy infrastructure and decentralized energy access. Uh, and there was an Oxford working paper, which uh, Nicholas Stern, Joseph Stiglitz, and all these people surveyed 300 stimulus packages, and they came down to the conclusion that clean energy infrastructure results in more jobs than traditional power generation and fossil fuel seven times more. So is that the way to go to make sure that we all bring in ourselves to a livelihood and a society which is really transitioning altogether as we are trying to cool the planet down? So just the, those thoughts coming from a poor country, we always talk more in ADDA format. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Um, uh, fascinating. But we have to go right across to Fodor. Uh, yes, Mark Fodor is the campaign coordinator of Defenders in Development. He's, um, of course, from the Coalition for Human Rights in Development, CHRD, uh, whose director had uh, joined us last time, Siddharth Akali. Uh, Mark joins us from Budapest. He will give us a broad overview before getting into the specifics about Bangladesh. Mark, we have no clue what you're going to say, but please give it to us now. Uh, hey, uh, thank you, Vidya, and thank you. Uh, there are a few tough acts to follow, and I'll actually limit what I say to make it quite short. Uh, I also think I'm, I'm a bit of a, on the, the side here, not, not the main focus of the talks here. Um, but just briefly, what a... Uh, broad overview um well, i'm talking about the banks as well uh here we've seen uh with COVID 19 that the banks have come in and they're just going in really intensive giving up money probably faster than they ever have uh, before uh and a lot of that money is going to supporting the emergency responses now uh ryan did touch a bit on that uh, i want to get into a bit more detail of what these emergency responses are that these banks are covering and again we're talking here about the world bank uh but also the for in bangladesh's case the asian development bank the asian I infrastructure investment bank now they're covering the public health response. They're covering uh, they're, they're covering issues around dissemination of information, issues around contact tracing. They're basically covering, uh, and I'm going to focus more on the Bangladeshi context. This is happening around the globe, but also conscious of time. Um, basically, they're they're covering a program that in Bangladesh is known as the National Preparedness, uh, sorry, it's the, I've got to get the name right here, but I think it's the National COVID Preparedness, National Preparedness and Response Plan for COVID-19, sorry. Now, um, this, and from the human rights perspective, what are we seeing? Uh, you, those of you in Bangladesh will know about reprisals against journalists that will be criticizing the government. Uh, you'll know uh, about some militarization contexts that are quite problematic. Uh, and there are other uh, issues as well that, that are definitely going to be coming up or have come up that are all part of how the government is responding to the COVID-19 situation. And for those of us following the institutions, our concern is that these institutions have these lofty claims about being for public participation, for stakeholder engagement, making sure they're contributing in a positive way. Now, apart from the fact that obviously, uh, or if it's not obvious to everyone, these are loans, so these are actually creating more debt uh, at a time when there, are e there is economic hardship. Uh, we have the added concern that they're contributing to a problematic situation and the way they're doing so, when I mentioned this National Preparedness and Response Plan for COVID-19, if you read through it, it is explicitly written there that law enforcement will be part of how the, uh, the solution will be implemented. 
uh, explicit, there's explicit description of technologies that could be dual use for surveillance is contact tracing. And the banks were part of the preparation of this national preparedness and response plan. So we have a, a situation where on the surface, if you read through it, it's not going to say abuse is going to happen, but it clearly is open to abuse. And there clearly have been situations of abuse in the, in the Bangladeshi context and not just in the Bangladeshi context, obviously. So I, I don't want to be pointing the finger to Bangladesh as being the worst player on the planet. I come from Hungary. We've had our finger, fingers pointed at us and rightfully so, uh, or at our government, I should say, not us. Um, so really what I wanted to do and, and really give a very brief uh, brief overview and really open it up for questions if there are any is, is just to, to point out that we have these institutions where we are, and just a bit of background on what's going on with the Defenders in Development Campaign 2, we are looking, and I am looking to mobilize uh, NGOs from different sectors to challenge these institutions so that they, when they do get into deals with governments, they do make sure that those standards that they have in place are maintained. But also, and this is getting taken one step further, that we are thinking about the fact that actually we're generating debt with this. So is this the best way to go? There is a large pressure for debt relief uh, at this point, and, and much of our constituency is also pushing for that. So that is my very, uh, I hope, quick enough overview. Uh, I really don't want to get into much detail because I realize there, a lot of this is about energy today. So I, I think I'm a bit of a showing what other issues are out there. <laughs> uh, and I'll end with that. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. We have plenty of uh, stuff going on, um, but I encourage everyone to use the chat to put in more questions or comments. Um, I'm just thinking, shall we just finish um, what was asked or pending from the previous um, seminar? And, uh, and then we can ask people who have uh, put questions or comments here to actually voice them out uh, themselves. Um, but you would need to put it in and then I will call upon you to do so. Uh, so I'll, I'll go to Monoarda first. Uh, so ATM uh, Zakir Hussain from Jagrata Juba Sangha had asked last time whether it's possible to create a strong, uh, to create stronger people's advocates over the lobbyists of business houses that influence power sector policy. Um, I'll give you the three questions that came to you, Manoar, all at once. Um, Amanur Rahman of Democratic Budget Movement asked, what is the exact external debt servicing status per annum in comparison to our GDP? Isn't domestic borrowing more alarming than the external debt if we compare it? So why are we always talking about external debt? Um, he didn't say the last, I did. Okay, uh, so Azad Abul Kalam from Action Aid Bangladesh asks, how will the large infrastructure projects impact food security and agriculture of Bangladesh in the post COVID-19 period? If you would take these three questions pending from last time, uh, then we can um, go on to um, those who have put up questions now. Noor Alam, you'll have to um, put your mic on mute, would you? And yes. Monora, you are supposed to um, come on. Should I respond to all these? Yes, uh, you cannot. Okay, just as much let as me, you can. Me. And if everyone else, uh, any, any of the others want to jump sure. in, you know that you have a Bangladeshi at heart in Ryan, even though he lives uh, elsewhere. So even Ryan might think he wants to jump in. But can you repeat me the first question that you say? I just... Sure, sure, sure. The first one. One second, where did we go? So, um, Zakir Hussain asked, whether it's possible to create stronger people's advocates yes. over the lobbyists of, of business that seek to influence power sector policy? or rather they influence power sector policy anyway. Thank you. Uh, each and every uh, responses would be 
mine. It's my personal opinion. And let me move off from the last one. Let me move up the ladder from the last one. The Amman's question. Uh, this is about the domestic loan and external loan. The figure essentially shows that the size of the domestic loan is 10.9% bigger than the external one. So it's something huge, it's something huge. But do two different kinds of loan, loans have different implications on economy. Uh, external loan has something different. Uh, it helps us, you know, it helps us uh, easing our balance of payment. So it has an additional, uh, additional uh, side of positive side. And internal loan has different implications. Currently, our uh, from the perspective of debt service, debt servicing, we are in a position of advantage. That what what other uh, international institutions say. Our external debt is kind of 34, currently 60, 36 uh, percent of GDP. That's quite uh, uh, you know, accommod accommodating because the threshold is for, for the for the uh, developing countries. The threshold is kind of 65 something. If it goes up to 65, then it is alarming. So we are in a position and a good position. So that's why people are. Uh, People for lending agencies around the world are eager to you know, lend us. Uh, so it means we can borrow from them, uh, depending on the scopes. So this is about uh, this is all about our external loan. Uh, but we are basically, from the perspective of our national economy, we are seriously concerned about concern about domestic loans because it has serious implication on our banking system. Our finance system uh, that has already been crippled, and something is going on in the banking sector as well. That it essentially shows that the health of the banking sector is not good. It cannot finance the whole economy, especially if, especially if we consider the uh, recovery of the economy from the COVID uh, damage. So this is this is one of the issue that requires much attention and deliberation. Uh, this is going on in Bangladesh soccer. And this is this is very interesting uh, whether we can put pressure on the international you know business groups uh, business groups to stop their aggressive behavior economic behavior on coal and you know, uh, like other uh, damaging industries and that's a serious implication adverse impact on the environment. It's very difficult to answer often you know, uh, because because of the nature because of the limited space of the civil society in Bangladesh that we are enjoying for the last couple of years uh, each and everyone knows including Bangladeshis uh, they know that our, our space for the civil society is shrinking drastically and it would be very difficult on part of Bangladeshi civil society even an individual to speak out against any social or uh, and these economic areas are really sensitive. Uh, and I'm sure that Mr. Jackie is concerned about it. However, however, it's not impossible. If we really work hand in hand uh, and if we develop relationship with each other, especially who are concerned about these issues. And I hope it will take place uh, in one way or another. And we will be, we'll be able to put pressure that what Mr. Jackie is anticipating. Uh, hopefully we can do it if we work together. Uh, this is, these are some of the few comments from my side. Did I leave anything? Has there has anything been left? Azad's uh, question. Azad. Yes. Do you remember it? Yeah. About the agriculture. Infrastructure. Infrastructure. Yeah. infrastructure. This is Azad knows it very well. Uh, this is you know this is this is a place for investment where people can make money. For example, in the health sector, what we have been observing for last last one decade that this and you know, health sector 
is dominated by two things basically investing on build, uh, constructing buildings and purchasing medical equipment so these are the two areas where people can make money the contractors the bureaucrats the political uh, political leaders who can make money from these two sides so you if you critically analyze the data relating to investment in the health sector especially investment from the uh, government you will see these two special items consumes almost 80% of the i would rather say 70% of the total investment government investment same is true to other areas including infrastructure so this is an arena where one can make quick money one can quick money not only by uh, selling or purchasing things but also you have to make different contacts to different government agencies so that contacts involves a lot of private so i was particularly concerned about food security and agriculture of bangladesh post covid it's it's that sector that he is particularly but i saw he was talking he was he was talking about infrastructure how will the large infrastructure projects impact food security and agriculture of bangladesh oh, he said oh last infrastructure uh, yeah <laughs> no i am not in a position to respond to this question right at this moment because that requires uh, getting some and a hard not data on me i don't have that i don't have a time now so hopefully i respond to in that if i get some time thank you oh, yeah. thank you manavar da there are more questions that have come to you you can check on the chat box but can we come back to you later later there's a question for uh, jaxis uh, from last time Uh, Zakir Hussain Khan from Change Initiative had asked, "Can you please analyze the total loan of Japan that's given to Bangladesh with special focus on the energy sector?" We have Bakako Kobayashi from Jaxus, and we also have Yuki Tanabe from da- Jaxus. Um, whoever wants to take the question, last time uh, Yuki was on board, and I think uh, the question was directed to Yuki. Yuki, are you there? Would you like to take that question on uh, Japanese loans to Bangladesh in the energy sector? Yeah, I I share the link now. Uh, this is a loaning plan of Japanese ODA for Bangladesh. Uh, these are all project, uh, ongoing project, uh, financed by Japanese government. So you can see how much for energy sector, how much. Yeah, for other sectors. Okay, um, Mark. There's a question. Oh, Ryan, how can we uh, forget you? Um, is this a new question from Jyotir Mai, or was it from last time? So until I figure that out, um, let me go to Mark. May I, Ryan? Um, So, Mark, there's a question from last time from um, again Hossein Khan from Change Initiative. As the current government is taking all criticism and campaigns as anti-government and anti-national, uh, how can we take support from international groups to protect human rights defenders and environmental activists? It depends if international groups is other. NGOs, or I'm not not really clear on that question, um, but uh, I, I this is a, a very typical tactic of governments, uh, including my own, uh, and it it is a situation that is quite challenging. I mean, we do have it depends on what we're talking about. As I said, if it's about supporting uh, people uh, who are looking to to get support from outside the country in a closing civic space. Uh, I will say this quite frankly: uh, a lot of organizations out there are doing this under the <laughs> under the table, so that no one sees it. This is being done. It w- there are obviously uh, secure communication issues that have to be addressed, and and other things like that. It's not impossible. It is challenging, and uh, unfortunately, in trying to reduce and trying to really. Constrain civic so- civil society in those countries. I'm not sure if I addressed the question directly, but it, if I if I understood the question, that that would be my answer to that. Is that unfortunately we're we're having to move into what 
this sort of dark area of, of not being seen in what we're doing. But I'm sure, um, you know, they can get back to you because as I said in the beginning, it's going to be more freewheeling in a bit. One last question that goes to Ryan from last time and then uh, we'll uh, sort of open up this Adda. Do you know what an Adda is, Mark? No. <laughs> It's especially when Bengalis get together and love to gossip and talk and talk about politics over a cup of tea. So there's no cup of tea, bring your own, uh, but there's plenty of um, talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we do with but, beer in Hungary. So yeah, <laughs> it's what we do with right. beer in Hungary, yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I muted my own mic. Ryan, her son, um, Barrister Jyotirmoy Barua from actually uh, the group that is co-hosting uh, today's webinar, uh, Life and Nature Safeguard Platform, asks, a new term of development refugee has evolved from displacement caused by so-called mega development projects. Those projects have displaced a large number of poor people who are innocent victims of development um, for large conglomerates. What are the national and international instruments to protect them? Ryan, that's a heavy one. Yeah. Um, well, you know, he's the lawyer. He should know the national one. Um, I'm the regional uh, advocacy guy, so I can dwell a little bit around the international law framing. But I understand his point uh, with massive mega infrastructure master plans um, and a lot of land acquisition happening in authoritarian regimes, the natural impact is displacement of poor people. This is, this is basically a power grab of land to build big infrastructure, right? So, and this is not going away. It's currently in a lull because of the pandemic, but it's gonna keep on rising soon. So when we say what are the policies which are going to protect the people, then you're looking at environmental and social safeguards policies of the different financiers. JICA has its own, the ADB has its safeguards policy and all of that. When we fight those battles, when we want people to be resettled uh, as per policy, then it ends up uh, as a war of attrition. You're trying to find meaning into a word like compensation or resettled site, uh, quality of living standards, and then the definition between what is my quality of life before displacement, what is my quality of life after displacement, as per the interpretation of that policy in that particular financial institution. Bearing in mind that multilateral development banks are above constitutional law. So international law, who governs international law? I remember one of my professors in uh, political economy used to say that is the weakest form of law because it cannot be implemented. And if you look at our battles in MDBs, safeguard policies, materializing on the ground and delivering doesn't happen because there's no enforceability, right? So what are you left with? What are you left with is massive displacement. What happens to the massive displacement? Rural to urban migration. And what is the absorption capacity of the state of those particular displaced communities? Then it becomes the national laws problem. But then again, the national... Uh, diaspora of the economy is the one which is going to bear the brunt of it. I mean, how many farmers pull rickshaws in Dhaka? You ask any rickshaw puller in Dhaka, what were you? They will say that I used to be a farmer up in the north. I used to be a fisher folk down in the south. And then they're here because of drought, because of famine, because of displacement. Da, 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 da. So do the laws even get implemented? It's a bleak notion, but it's a very important one because it creates inequality, it creates cheaper labor, it creates further exploitation of the poor. And um, I guess uh, if Jyotima Boru was in the call, he would probably give us a bit more meat around what are the constitutional protections that people will have, especially around uh, projects which are financed internationally, because it's a sovereign issue, right? So we might have some protections in the constitution, but it is an uphill battle to make sure that the laws get implemented. Yes, um, I'm glad um, the barrister has got together with others like him and uh, we look forward to um, uh, many positive changes um, 
you know, through the Supreme Court. Um, we have um, a couple of um, um, questions uh, first directed to Manohar Mustafa again. Manohar, are you there? Kuntal Roy uh, from GSCC has a couple of questions. Kuntal, would you ask your questions? Um, one on um, LNG as clean fuel and the other on um, coal share being 5,000 out of 41,000 megawatts of the new um, coal fired plants coming up close to you. Kuntal, are you going to I, ask a question? I guess, I guess Kuntal, that was Kuntal's one of the comments perhaps rather than question. Yeah, one. The second one looks like a comment. The first one, I think he wants some kind of response from you. But Kuntal, go ahead. Well, uh, it's a, you can say it's a comment or a question, whatever you like. But uh, my point is, looks like the government will review its power sector master plan and the next power generation strategy for the government would be focusing on LNG. So, uh, like uh, what uh, Power Cell uh, Director General and also the Power Ministry told recently that uh, LNG is kind of clean fuel, just like clean coal. So, do we have the strategy to counter this narrative? Because government is not going to consider renewable energy as the alternative to coal. So, you can say the comment, you can say the question, whatever it is. But maybe a response would be. Fantastic. Yep, that's all. Go ahead, Monoda. Well, let me let me say quite a few words on it. And uh, perhaps Puntol and I myself, we are on the same boat. Well, there is a feeling in the uh, feeling in the uh, policy community that government is going to revisit its energy plan considering some of the issues that I have been talking about, uh, cost, you know, everything. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are shifting their focus from uh, fossil fuel to completely renewable energy. Because in the renewable energy part, uh, in my view, there are some misunderstanding in their, in, the, in, the, in their brain that it costs too much, especially in Bangladesh. So that particular issue requires much more deliberation and engagement with the policymakers on part of people who are advocating for uh, solar or other clean energy. One of the prime reasons they are uh, putting forward that the cost of the land is very high and they are giving so much example on it. But alternatively, we have proposed something different. Uh, we said, well, the incentive package, different both monetary and non-monetary incentive that you are offering for other independent power plants, that should be reviewed. And you should focus on the incentive package towards uh, uh, clean energy uh, investors. For example, if cost of the land is high, so government can come up with the incentive package the subsidy. Even government has so much you know, uh, land uh, as had what we call the government land or cash land, they could offer it. There are a lot more solutions uh, if we really want to uh, move our attention to renewable energy, uh, living behind the fossil fuel one. So these are the one of the areas that's, that the policy advocates in the power sector, people like us, who should pay particular attention to and do whatever we could do, engaging ourselves with the policy makers. That's from my side, coming from my side. Thank you, Manorda. I think you've also, um, in the process, um, answered another question that had come to you. But let's move on to uh, one of our other. But speakers. I saw one of the questions directed to uh, uh, Ryan Bai. And that's why that I was said Nibedita. he was. Yes, yes, I'm going to make you work sure. very hard because you're now boss at ECF in Bangladesh. We need to put you to a good work. I'm not allowed to speak <laughs> all of those issues because my independence of freedom has been curtailed to a certain extent. Anyway, let's move. I'm in the civil society domain. 
<laughs> so Ryan Hassan, you have a question from Nivedita Ahmed, um, who is in Stockholm University. When the people of Bangladesh are still struggling for their basics, she says, how do you suggest to include them um, towards the bid for clean energy or towards clean energy? Oh, I think and by let me bring my tea by this time. Okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> Get me one too, man. Send it over. Ryan, if you're going to take two minutes, I'm also going to get my drink. Sure. I mean, I can. Uh, should I respond to the question, though? Yes, please. Oh, please. Right. And I think it's, it's a very good question. And thank you for uh, asking it. Uh, I, I think it, that's the area where everybody should be thinking about. Um, because if we, if we do not have the people in as a part of the conversation around clean energy, then this will not be this will not lead to any real results. So um, one thing is for certain, globally, Bangladesh has been depicted as the big, bad coal burning, fossil fuel burning government, which is disregarding the pathway towards the Paris alignment and is being shamed for it. And to a certain extent, every single person in this call and the entire energy campaign globally uh, has done an enormously great job in highlighting that and naming and shaming and calling the government out on this. And this sustained pressure is very much required. It, it, it will yield results. Do not give up hope, continue fighting. Saying that, saying that, nationally are the people with you in this big giant fight on Paris alignment and bringing Bangladesh to clean, uh, to zero emissions for Paris alignment, right? Uh, the answer is no, because it's a livelihood struggle. It's a livelihood struggle, and with, a, with an economy which is crippling, it's very difficult to get people's attention on clean energy when their basic livelihoods are not being met. So where, did, where do you bring the people in? Now, what we have always done, and by, uh, by us I mean activists and movements and civil society and NGOs, we, we sometimes get so busy in our work, we forget the theoretical framework under which we are all operating. And we all have our own theoretical frameworks under which we operate. Now, if you look at a political movement on the ground, which is looking at sovereignty of national resources and distribution of those resources among societies, say for example, the left alliances in our country who are fighting for the rising price of gas, and they're mobilizing, petitioning, calling strikes. That, that people's voice is there. It's very much there. And they're not talking about clean energy infrastructure, mind you. If you're listening to the left correctly, they're talking about the price of gas. And they're talking about affordability and what people need. So there is, there is the people's movement there. I don't want to, I don't want to, maybe we're not, we're not looking at it right. It depends on what your lens is. If you're an NGO lens, then you're not looking at the left, you're looking at the issue and you need the transition to happen. But the fact that there are people concerned on the energy conversation in general, that has always been in the country. Now look at one of the biggest, brightest movements that we had. Two, Shundarban, the Shundarban movement, to st and the second one, the Rampal movement and the Fulbari coal mine movement. Both of them led to national level movements for household people to walk for thousands of miles and uh, try to stop projects and all of that. But those struggles were actually struggles which focused on livelihood issues, on rights issues. Uh, indigenous people were shot dead by state forces in the Fulbari movement, leading to a public uproar. Um, for the Rampal movement, it was protect Shundarbans. Shundarbans is close to the heart of the people, which led to a spark and a jolt across the entire nation for the people to take on. Is clean energy that spark? Is it that romantic? Does it capture the average person to move? Now, this is something which we really have to understand in our work. You know, Action Aid is in this call. Uh, there are people in this call who have resources to talk to people at both national and international levels. And I would address their focus to bring to the fact that you need to bring the arena of the politics away from the state into the people. By that I mean, 
Right now, the energy policy conversation is between quick rental power producers, Bangladesh government, multilateral development banks, and it's closed door. And they're not asking the people how they're going to design the loans or design those projects. But does it not matter to the people to know those things? Okay, if they don't let me talk about it inside their closed doors, we will bring the conversation into the streets. We'll bring the conversation into the newspapers. We will bring the conversation of policy and define it in our own agenda, in our own territory. Now, this is where we really have to think about it because COVID-19 gives you an opportunity to do that. People are dying uh, because of poverty. So there is dissent. Uh, there is a real need from the, uh, from the government now for the social contract as a citizen that the government should deliver all the taxes that I paid. Now I can't eat. Now where is my bailout? Where is my electricity? So the public is hungry for that. But now the public has to have a piece in the development planning process. And that cannot be done with anger, mind you. So, you know, work which DBM does, Bangladesh Working Group does, uh, the National Committee does, uh, all of the work which is happening requires civil society, people's movements to start having conversations about the long-term development plan and not leave it up to the government that they will decide and we will react. We should have alternative plans on inclusivity, alternative plans on clean energy, alternative plans on gas transitioning and prices of gas. And I think... Um, that, that is where a lot more work is required. We needed Monwar Bhai here because, you know, he might help us out in doing these conversations with groups. And, um, yeah, from a regional network, we will do our bit in that collective effort. So Ryan, uh, Nibetata, I'm sorry. I asked your question, even though it was a new question. Uh, do you want to corroborate? Do you want to get back to Ryan uh, on this adda? Uh, is there anything you want to say right now in response to what Ryan said? Meanwhile, meanwhile, uh, our honor, honorable speaker, Vidda, can I supplement? Can I supplement something with Ryan? Sure, sure. sure. If, if you want. Ryan was wanting you to supplement, and I'm glad yeah. that you were uh, stepping <laughs> up to it. Let let me let me rephrase it a different way. People, and I mean the general people, mass people, uh, they are not concerned about the policies of the government. They are basically concerned about the outcome of the policies and practices government is doing. I have been on the street for many years. I, I would rather say significant time of my life on the street as a political activist. So we have been concerned about the outcome. And when we have been speaking out on, the, on something, that was all about the outcome of the policy. So this financial burden people are having now, as far as electricity is concerned, Actually, people are speaking on part of their financial burden that now they are uh, uh, badly experiencing. So this, we have been, we have been talking about, or we still talk about the policies because we don't have other things to do, perhaps. Anyway, so we are talking about uh, policy. But people are talking about outcome. Now the electricity prices, prices and gas prices has gone up perhaps five times during the last 10 years. It costs too much as far as their financial burden is concerned. So general people, yes, they are concerned about, concerned about electricity, although indirectly, as it has uh, created so much pressure on their uh, family economy in terms of uh, financial burden. My mom, my mom in the village, living in the village, there, she's experiencing it. I have been experiencing many times, although it's a slight increase. 100 taka or something like this. But 100 taka does so much matter. It, it matters too much to my mom who is living in village. But 100 taka doesn't matter too much while I'm living in the capital. So obviously, this is general people who are concerned about, in this sense, they are concerned about the uh, policy uh, that the government is currently pursuing. That's why we are asking the government to redirect its attention to solar energy that would significantly reduce the cost of the electricity. So in this sense, uh, it, 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 it really, uh, the issue is really linked to the mass people. That's what I wanted to convey the message to you guys. And I have sent a comment to Azad that uh, it would be 
I, I would love to see Azad is speaking on his own point because this is serious. Actually, Azad has made a couple of comments in the chat box. And Azad, why don't you, um, Azad Abdul Kalam from Action Aid Bangladesh, we're waiting to hear from you. Unmute yourself um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, have your video on and we'd like to hear from you. Thank okay. you. There, there you Allah. are. There you are. Hi. And yes. this is your Biplobi. <laughs> Thank you so much. If it is the Adda mood, then uh, we have to open for all, all the participants. Uh, they can uh, talk here and I yes. think it, it yes. would be nice. So the, uh, our discussion is very nice. Jolene, actually, I am uh, asking about uh, our, uh, especially in this situation, our agriculture and farmers saving our society saving our uh, country uh, by their uh, food production in last uh, boro season and continuing uh, vegetable production and uh, other food production. So uh, uh, development uh, financiers like World Bank, ADB and other investors investing here for some health sector and some of uh, uh, economic recovery uh, for COVID. But uh, agriculture and food security sector is not focused uh, in the World Bank or ADB's uh, uh, fund channeling. So my question was about to uh, the issue, uh, the infrastructure development projects, funding to the infrastructure investment like power and roads and other uh, infrastructure and uh, uh, in the name of health sector and in the name of uh, uh, recovery of uh, economy during COVID. So my question was to you to more clarification, more understanding uh, about our, in, in this uh, pandemic period, our agricultural sector and food production sector investment uh, by, the, uh, by the World Bank, ADB, or AIB, or other investors. Jolly Wright? Ajat, can I, uh, Bigda, can I respond to? Thank you. Please. Okay. Ajat, uh, we have been talking this issue, we have been discussing on this issue uh, during the last three weeks, perhaps, on while we are engaged in a webinar or discussion in a food security network or something. Agriculture has got much attention, particularly in the period of COVID-19, especially in Bangladesh, for several understandable reasons. From a very economic point of view, this, the most strongest reason is, this is the agriculture, sector that employs 42.42% labor force in our country. Yesterday, I was giving an interview to one of the satellite channel in Bangladesh, it's called ATN News. They were asking the same questions to me. I said, well, this is the only sector, agriculture sector that could save our economy to move forward. Save our economy now and pave the way to move forward. He was asking how and why. I said it employs 42% uh, labor force. And this 42% labor, labor force, if it represents 42% families of our country, it essentially means that even you have to keep in mind that the poor people or near poor people, they are in this uh, domain. So if we truly, uh, 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 if we truly activate our agriculture sector, sector increase our production volume, and uh, uh, keep our supply chain quite easy, particularly this time, it would greatly help the agriculture sector in general and poor and marginal people in particular. So the government should completely focus on agriculture sector now. This is one point and government is more or less clear about this issue. 
as I got the sense from while talking to so many ministers during the last two weeks. And they have invested, they have put some money on, on it. Although there are a lot of questions about how to deliver this uh, money. That's a different question altogether. But as far as the question of multilateral institutions, whether, why don't they, why, why they are not that much interest in uh, investing in agriculture now? To respond to this question, I have a different opinion. They invested a loss during the 70s, 80s, even early 90s, and made a devastating effect, particularly in northern areas and many other areas, in the name of uh, uh, you know, digging the canals, putting the you know, shallow tube oils, everything. They have made, it, made a mess. We don't want to see. But personally, I don't want to see multi other institutions are coming up with huge amount of money investing on agriculture. Rather, it's the responsibility of the government to become prudent and conscious about our environment and ecology. And, and they should make their investment in that way. That's why my understanding is I don't want to see multi other institutions in this area. Even to a certain extent, considering the strength of our economy now, we don't need them even. And perhaps they realized it. That's why they have, they have shifted all their investment portfolio to other areas, for example, energy, and a large scale investment, or uh, in, in, in some other bridges, roads, in other areas. So this is our responsibility. I mean, the government's responsibility to reactivate the agriculture sector and giving a space for the farmers. And, it, it, and the COVID-19 period has given us a tremendous opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to, to reactivate our uh, agriculture, giving a space for the farmers. At least they can uh, uh, get their fair prices. And we are proposing so many alternatives how to, uh, uh, how to help these uh, poor and marginal farmers at least they can get their fair prices. That's why we are focusing on the supply chain. So the biggest challenge over uh, our agriculture sector now, in my, in my opinion, is to make an easy supply chain, reducing the cost of uh, production and, uh, and the middlemen who are taking a big pie from the costs, I mean, from the from supply chain. If we can, focus our attention on that supply chain, we can do a lot for the farmers and that would significantly reduce the burden of poverty, particularly in the COVID period. The reason I'm saying it, before the COVID period, the government statistics showed that there are 20% people who are poor. It means that almost 70, 80% of the families I mean, 80 lakhs families, 80 lakhs families are poor, but several uh, surveys, statistics, and different economists of different corners, they are saying the poverty level has gone up. Some are saying in Bangladesh now, almost 40% people have become poor because COVID-19 has damaged family economies in many ways. And it affects, uh, it, has, it has made a damaging effect uh, on different professions. Still, we don't have that hard nut facts, but we can realize it. However, all of our attention should be focused on agriculture now, and we have to, we have to bring our uh, government accountable for that, that large scale investment going to the uh, farmers, I mean the agriculture sector, and equitably distributed, uh, removing the corruption involved with it. So that's the first priority, and I'm sure it would, it would not charge 42% labor force in our country and significantly attack the poverty uh, in the country. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Noor Alam Sheikh of Life and Nature Safeguard Platform. Um, Noor, would you like to ask your question, please? He had addressed it to um, uh, Monor, but um, others can also pitch in. Um, Mehdi, Ryan, um, anyone else. Uh, also from the floor, if anyone wants to respond. But Noor, can we hear from you directly? 
that if you get, it's an adda. It's an adda. But where is Noor? Has he gone to get his tea? Yes, I have here. If you get him, then please ask your question. Use any um, any language you please. Oh, uh, easy to Bangla. I can say Bangla, Bengali. Yes, uh, use Bengali, no problem. Uh, two question uh, have. সম্প্রতি আমাদের দেশের বিদ্যুৎ প্রতিমন্ত্রী তিনি বলেছেন যে বিদ্যুৎ কোন ঘাটতি নাই এবং ঘাটতি নাই এবং করোনাকালে বিদ্যুতের চাহিদাও কমেছে তাহলে কেন আমরা এখন এই রামপালের মতো এরকম কয়লা ভিত্তিক যেসব বিদ্যুৎ কেন্দ্র আছে সেগুলো নির্মাণ কাজ আমরা কেন বন্ধ করবো না আর কি আমি সেটা বলেছি আর একটা বলেছে আমি রামপালের কথা বলেছি যে সুন্দর যেহেতু এখন সৌর বিদ্যুতের বিশ্বের সম্প্রতি প্রথম আলো পত্রিকা একটা রিপোর্ট এসেছে বিশ্বের সৌর বিদ্যুতের উৎপাদন খরচ কমেছে সৌর বিদ্যুৎ জলবিদ্যুৎ তাহলে কেন আমরা এখন এই সুন্দরবন বিনাশে রামপাল বিদ্যুৎ প্রকল্প নির্মাণ কাজ চালিয়ে যাব কেন এটা বন্ধ করব না এই দুইটা প্রশ্ন ছিল আমার কাইন্ডলি এটা আপনারা I think Mehdi, Mehdi should respond to this question. Mehdi, do you want to go? Maybe you should. Yeah, um, uh, I should not uh, respond to any question because uh, I wanted to uh, be the background worker on this. Uh, no, bhai, no, one thing uh, is uh, there was a long struggle uh, uh, to stop Rampal coal power plant nearby Sundarbans. Uh, the government has now, uh, as per the minister told uh, us uh, two days ago, the government has three contracts now according to his speech. But uh, I know there are six coal power plants are, uh, are under construction now. So um, we have to keep our struggle, one thing. Second thing is, uh, yes, we know uh, in India, we can get uh, cheapest uh, solar power in India, which is uh, in Bangladesh, it's a little bit costly now. It's, it's now around 11 point some taka per unit, but it will go very, very soon. It will go uh, uh, below the coal in Bangladesh also. So we have to, we have to keep our struggle uh, going on against this coal uh, in Russia. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mehdi. Noor, if you, uh, are you satisfied with that answer? Because we are now running a little short on time. Nivedita Ahmed wanted to ask Ryan Pai a few more questions. Nivedita was uh, saying that she's in a very um, uh, um, uh, noisy environment and she was finding it difficult. But um, if she is now Nivedita, can you hear me? And are you able to ask your questions, the additional questions? She wrote um, uh, uh, questions or, or comments. Okay, uh, she is here. Uh, she's written her question. But do you want me to uh, ask or do you, or should I? Maybe I should. You can re read if out. You, yeah. If you can unblock yourself, then please go ahead. Uh, Fulbari movement was one of the biggest success stories for the sake of people in our history, I believe. But regarding Sundarban's coal power plant uh, movement, we see that they, the government, successfully managed to divide the people, which seemed to lead to um, succeed in their agenda. What do you think was wrong in that movement regarding unifying people? I mean, I'm sorry if this is a silly question, says Nivedita from Stockholm University. To, um, this is a question that quite a lot of you might be interested in answering. Um, so feel free. Uh, I can take a crack at it, but it's not my area of expert. No, uh, but um, uh, Ryan, sometimes uh, living away uh, while being Bangladeshi gives you a lens that might be interesting. So yes, please go ahead. Oh, well, during the Fulbari movement, to a certain extent, we were observing it from a distance as civil society, but also personally being a part of it with friends in different ways. 
So I can speak from, a, I guess, from a bird's eye view perspective about the movement itself, which might help. Slight uh, more power to your sorry, introduction. Sorry, sorry, yes. my, my microphone was not here. Uh, so the Fulbari movement was, I wouldn't say that the movement was not successful. The, move, the movement did unite everybody. The movement did not, was not able to stop the power plant. That, that is definitely uh, the result, right? That's the objective. The movement was there to stop the power plant. Plant is still there. I think they're already in operation or something. But what happened during the course of the movement was uh, something beautiful and organic happened. You found people from all walks of life stepping out in Shaba, getting tear gassed by the state authorities for the love of the forest. And uh, for some reason, uh, sorry, uh, for, for stopping the project. And Fulbari in itself was, it's a newer breed of people who are part of the environmental movement to stop the Sundarbans, right? For Rampal. From the older Fulbari movement to the current Rampal movement, a whole brigade of young people worked very, very hard behind the scenes in the National Committee. This I am aware of, you know, Kuntal Roy, you hear these names, like right? all these young kids, even younger than me are a part of that and who've worked hard, who've taken to the streets. They came out of this and they are doing energy work now and they are moving forward. So to say that that did not lead to a result wouldn't be fair. What, did the movement get fractured? Now that's something, that's an area where I am not the right person to comment on as to what were the causes for the movement to fracture, but movements fracture all the time, both in the international regional circuit as well as the national circuit. One of the reasons for that is a fundamental approach towards movement building and agenda setting and negotiations. One part of the movement will always be conservative left, hard line, no project, no negotiation. One part of the movement will be alternative reform, trying to get it, trying to make it better. Now somewhere these different, these two polar opposites that let's try to make things better and the, than what it was before and the other is let's get rid of it entirely if it continues moving that way, it will fracture. Sooner or later, one group will get aligned, one group will not. Now, the opposite side of the table was the Bangladesh ruling party formed a 14-party coalition to form government, of which the left is also a part. So let's not name names, but we are all aware that the left is very much a part of the 14-party coalition. So the, within the left movement in Rampal, Many defected and took the government side on Rampal. Even people we know within civil society who we have campaigned for before on around IFI issues. So those political differences have happened because of even the dynamics and the political preferences of people maturing through the movement. And we still have one good thing which came out, which is the alternative master plan to the power sector master plan, which came out from the Rampal movement. So when the government was saying coal this way, gas this way, renewable this way, because of Rampal, that debate led to an entire alternative pathway to be developed. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't take, yeah, it's one project lost, but many more will stop. It was very difficult to get another coal power plant running. If we keep on making noise as much as we are with Matarbari, and Rampal, it is getting more and more difficult for the government to take on a coal power plant in Bangladesh than it was even two years ago. And I think it's going to get way more harder for them as they move forward, both from the financer side as well as the political landscape side. And yeah, let's hope for the best. Can I add something with Tran Bhai about this question? Yes, yes, you must. Yeah. But keep it short because we also, Very um, Very I short. mean, but Azad, yes, go ahead. Very short. Uh, for no, so, no, you don't need to be very so sure. There is two basic things in uh, between Fulbari and Rampal movement. In Fulbari movement, uh, local people, especially local community, they are fully engaged with the movement. 
and the national groups like uh, national committee and other leftists without two leftist party they engage with the movement in later in that period community already movement uh, raised uh, uh, raised uh, uh, high uh, in the other hand in rampal local community is not mobilized by the national committee or by the other leftist party so rampal movement fully missing in local community because of in such a movement like uh, local infrastructure projects or like uh, mine projects when local community protesting against that project it will task to uh, implement the project by government or by any uh, any investors but when local community missing it is very tough to uh, to to uh, stop uh, such a project by uh, national level movement like the national committee or other leftist group did in uh, rampal so this is the main difference uh, between these two uh, cases in our country so if you see in other uh, movements in our country like other land movements other movements against uh, infrastructure development project for uh, example in very close to dhaka and kirani gaunt government plan to develop a, uh, a residence for government officials in kirani gaunt and they they are targeting to uh, acquire huge land local people just stand against the project and government back so this is the uh, scenario when community people when local people engage with the movement movement must be suppressed but our community people missing movement very tough to suppress so this is the issue thank you so much thank you azad bhai uh, ryan before we go into wrap up i must give you um, the message from farzana ahmed to you you are always an amazing presenter she says sir almost after a decade i'm listening to you again um uh, mehdi uh, has um, told us all that already the government has cancelled the second phase of the rampal coal power plant and converted it um to develop it into a solar power plant well that's good news indeed um there is a question uh, one last question if i may take it to mehdi because i think it's important to discuss it's from zakir hussain khan from change initiative he says can we start the process of filing a writ petition in the supreme court against the quick supply of energy and power a special provision act which gives immunity to all the power plants after this we'll wind up hmm? okay thank yes, you uh, thank you zakir bhai for your question uh, we uh, we already um, started a process to uh, to uh, organize a, an, another webinar on legal aspect of energy sector in bangladesh with uh, uh, this this initiative has been taken with uh, school of people's law um, which is going to happen on 10th july i think and uh, i think gaurangoda uh, in the closing speech he will uh, focus on on it more thank you thank you mehdi that was short and sweet unlike uh, before coming uh, to ran uh, yes monor before yes. coming to ran i have i just see an in very interesting question forwarded to me uh, by jyoti moida mm. it is very interesting mm. as it reads how to make the dictator listen to your suggestion yes 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 that was there yes yes, yes jyoti moida i have an answer hmm. it's very easy and as it sounds i do not know but i have a footnote i have a footnote but i have a footnote a very interesting yeah 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 i have a footnote footnote says <coughs> i still follow the gandhi's uh, campaign doc approach is a gandhian campaign uh, campaign approach it says you have to insist or provoke and you have to keep insisting or provoking 
until the authority responds. This is the approach I intend to take. So I have to provoke until they respond. That's it. Thank you. Dada, um, uh, the provocation might lead to another follow-up webinar. Um, let's see. Uh, hopefully, we will keep convening like this uh, during this time of lockdown and, um, you know, um, physical distances. Um, let our hearts grow fonder and uh, I invite uh, somebody who's really um, uh, somebody so many people are fond of, Gauranga Nandi. Chairperson, Center for Environment and Participatory Research, CEPR, and contributor to BBC Bangla, to please sort of, um, sort of bring it all together and end it on a high note. Gaurangada. Yes, thank you, Bidda. And thanks to all. It's a very good discussion. Uh, but, uh, in first, uh, I, am, uh, I am giving the special thank to Ryan and uh, Abul Kalam Ajad because uh, they are very rightly said what's the difference between the two people's uh, band, between the uh, full body and the uh, Rampal. And, uh, uh, Dada, Dada uh, please, please uh, unmute your video, please. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Ryan Hassan is uh, correctly explained the, uh, the total national and international situation regarding the Rampal issues. And uh, Abul Kala Majad is rightly said for the cause behind it uh, because uh, actually I was ready to say this point because uh, listening to Ryan Hassan the, in the Rampal cases people initiated the movement but that movement gone and led through the uh, national uh, committee and the lack of the um, uh, um, uh, participation, lack of participation of the community. I, I think this is the actual fault of the uh, uh, Rampal issues. And uh, another the point which is cited by the uh, Ryan Hassan is absolutely correct. Uh, we have already discussed almost two hours. Uh, discussion was very lively and is very good uh, in the very last moment the Jyotir Mada asked a very good questions which is rightly answered by Manor Mustafa also. Uh, I have announced some uh, events like this because you know that uh, now we are Closing overall discussion. Uh, we are going to organize more specific webinar. With the rightly said, because we are passing this very crucial time, we are facing the COVID 19 all over the world. So we are practicing and we are maybe absorbing the webinar <laughs> and, and the, like this systems. So we are going to organize more specific webinars as the next steps of discussions. On 10th July 2020, Friday, we are going to organize a webinar on energy related acts of Bangladesh with a special focus on the Immunity Act, which is called formally uh, Quick supply of energy and power, special provision 210. This program will be organized jointly by BWZED and School of People's Law. Uh, from third week of July, 
another series of discussion would be started in the name of listen to bangladesh in that series we will meet with the affected communities directly so that national and international activists can listen to the human stories from them directly we are inviting all of you to connect with us to break the myths and profit based infrastructure development so i have finished thank you very much thanks to all thanks to the participant and thanks to especially bidda who rightly uh, coordinated managed and moderated thank you thank you bangladesh working group on external debt and the uh, nature Sa safeguard platform for uh, bringing us all together thank you yes.